Thank you for tuning into the Dr. Chris Radio of Horror show. Tonight on Dr. Chris's Radio of Horror, in a recorded interview during quarantine 2020, going all the way back in time to the early 2000s, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, where we actually are right now, used to have a mall where the cancer center is now. There's a cancer center in Worcester to help people that don't have to go all the way to Boston for cancer treatments and other medical needs can go to this center. But there used to be a mall there. It was an outlet mall. It had a bunch of rather interesting stores. And uh, I'd always remember there was one store in particular that was like a combination of like movies and books and DVDs and stuff like that. A huge selection. But also below this theater, below this mall, was a was a couple of theaters. There was a Playhouse Theater and there was the Bijou Cinema. The Bijou Cinema was an old art house cinema where they would play artsy, fartsy foreign films and independent films and and first run films that would only very go to maybe the back of the uh, more local theaters like the Showcase. Back when movie theaters were a thing. So depending on you know when we start playing this, movie theaters could be all wiped out due to the virus, which I hope doesn't not happen. The Bijou Cinema was one of the favorite staples of Worcester, Massachusetts. Unfortunately, it has been closed for many, many, many years. One of the films I saw I saw at the Bijou Cinema was a little independent horror movie called Malevolence. And on the show with us tonight is the director of Malevolence, Stephen Mina. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Stephen. Hey, how you doing, guys? It's actually it, Mena, but that's all right. It's Mena. Okay, is it Steven or Steve? Uh, Steve is fine. Okay. Steve, uh, for people not familiar with Malevolence, uh, tell the audience a little bit about it. It's a slasher, bank robbery, uh, combination uh, drama thriller that uh, has two sequels, a, or rather a prequel and a sequel, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. You pretty much just uh, summed it all up. <laughs> But that's the first um, movie. Malevolence is a bank robbery gone rob, as they basically are three bank robbers who kidnap a mother and daughter and accidentally find out that their hideaway house is the home of a unknown, notorious serial killer. Very much akin to the st- the style of the movie is very much akin to Halloween. Yeah, uh, Halloween was a huge influence on the film, and uh, the structure of the film was very influenced by Psycho. The way it starts out as one genre picture and turns into something completely different it goes from. Uh, you know, like this action kidnapping film to a slasher film. Um, so, you know, we, and we wanted to, like, you know, turn it on its head at the 30-minute mark to kind of, you know, throw everybody off. And um, it's been done a few times, but I'd never seen it done that way with a slasher film, so I thought it was kind of a unique uh, approach. Um, and uh, it's it was great to, you know, just recall back to that Bijou Theater because I remember really liking that theater. I remember you could get a beer in that theater, which was like the coolest thing ever. Which is and, pretty uh, commonplace nowadays in like now, theaters yeah, but like back AMC. Then it wasn't, uh, but but it, was, it was cool because that was actually the premiere of the film. It was the first time we actually showed the film to an audience that wasn't like, you know, friends and family and stuff like that. So it was like the first time we got real feedback. And I remember the, the wow. film went over yeah, it went over like gangbusters at that uh, screening and it was that screening was part of the reason why um, you know it got to ended up getting all the way to Anchor Bay and getting picked up because uh, of the, all the positive. Uh, oh, news Anchor Bay! And you know what's funny? You know how I knew we had. They don't exist special? anymore, though, right? Well, they do, but they were bought by uh, Lionsgate, uh. Um, so they kind of got you know absorbed into Lionsgate. But I just, I just the thing that sticks in my mind the most about that screening was the theater had no air conditioning, and so huh. it was like a hundred degrees in there, and nobody left. One guy actually like went out into the he went to the bathroom and like threw up because he was so sick from the heat. I remember a gunner coming up to me after the screening. He's like, "Man, this is going to be a hit." I said, "Why?" He goes, "Because I couldn't even breathe in there and nobody got up and left." Huh. So, now you I don't told us. Remember f- that? Uh, I don't remember that, but I do remember you telling a pretty funny story about uh, about uh, about um, Gunner Hansen and uh, your parents own a house on Webster Lake, and he was trapped there. Over at night, I, 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 okay. The details of the story may, I mean, eighteen years ago is a long time. Gunner's first time seeing the movie was on a house in Webster Lake, and the only way to get to this, uh, this house, of course, is by boat. And you would take the ferry back, and Gunner was left there, and the movie scared the crap out of him. And this is the guy, who, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know who Gunner Hansen is, he has passed away, but he what played Leatherface in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's also in Steven's other movie, uh, which is a big favorite of mine, uh, Brutal Massacre. Yeah, yeah, Gunner had said that he um, he watched the film on his little island retreat up in Maine uh, and um, and 
he did. He said it, it scared him to the point where he was so excited about the film that he wanted to come down to the screening to, to meet with me and to meet, you know, the producers and, and, you know, just, just literally just hang out when he found out that it was in Worcester. So um, that's how I met him. And we became fast friends because I told him what a huge influence his film was on me. Uh, so I was totally starstruck to meet the guy because I was just, you know, always such a huge fan of that film. And I told him, I said, you know, eventually I'd love to make a movie with you uh, at some point. So it was really cool to actually make good on that and cast him in Brutal Massacre. And of course, he completely steals the show. And as a matter of fact, um, we're going to be re-releasing Brutal Massacre on Blu-ray for the first time this summer. Uh, we just finished the disc. It's a it's a DVD Blu-ray combo, but it's got tons of extras. It's got a lot of stuff where we have a lot of footage from some of the cons that we did with Gunner talking and um, you know the whole cast: Ken Fury, David Naughton, um, you know everybody. So. Um, it should be really cool when that comes out because it's. Uh, I was really disappointed with the release that Anchor Bay put out. They kind of just dropped it on the corner of a street and ran away. You know, that was like the extent of their release. And I don't think uh, they did a really good job on the DVD itself. I don't think they did it justice. So I'm really happy to finally re-release this and, and you know give it the the proper release that it deserves because I, I think it does have a a pretty awesome fan base, but they really haven't seen uh, the film the way it was intended. Um, so now on Blu-ray, you're really going to see it almost for the first time when you see the, the difference in quality. And, um, you know, so I'm really excited about that coming out. So, okay, so that was like 2002 or 2003 when the first one came out. And then I was at a yard sale with my mother years later uh, in well, Oxford, Massachusetts, not that far from Webster. Uh, in fact, it's the town right next to it. And at someone's yard sale, they had a copy of Bereavement. And I was like, the name sounds familiar. Where have I heard that before? And I flipped it around and read in the back, and it says it's the it's the prequel to Malevolence. And that movie starred uh, Michael Biehn of Terminator uh, Aliens fame. And in fact, what's funny is I'm talking to you right now. I'm actually working with his wife, uh, Jennifer Blank Biehn, on a project. Oh, very cool. She's awesome. Yeah. We're doing a um we're doing something involving involved with uh some type of message about COVID-19. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I I I became good friends with them over the years and uh um I was actually involved in their release um for a film. Oh god, I can't remember the name. It was a slasher film uh that Michael Bean had worked on and starred in. Cherry I Falls? The name. No, no, no. It was something he did with Jennifer. Oh, um, The Victim. The Victim. Yeah. Uh, we helped them do their release in uh, in New York City, uh, theatrically. So, um, but yeah, 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 that's really cool that you're working with them. I'm glad to see that they're actually still uh, out there making movies. It's funny that your actress from Bereavement is going to be playing uh, Lois Lane coming up in Superman: Man of Tomorrow, a new directed DVD uh, animated DC uh, movie. Yeah, she is all over the place. She's uh, really she really took off. It's um, I'm so happy for her. You know, yeah. After she did True Detective, it really, you know, she went into the stratosphere and uh, never came back down. I think that uh, I think she's uh, she she's kind of known and unknown as a, like it, it, like you're right. She's been on True Detective before, but I I don't know. I mention her name sometimes, and people don't know who I'm talking about. You know what I mean? It's one of those people that everyone knows her face, but they don't necessarily know her name. Right. Um, or I, they remember her in roles like Baywatch or Texas Chainsaw 3D. <laughs> Yeah, nobody remembers that. But. <laughs> <laughs> and if they do, they're trying to forget it. <laughs> well, it's funny is I found out she's going to be in San Andreas too, and I'm just like, wait, they're making a sequel to San Andreas? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, uh, you know, look, this, if there's an audience for it, they'll make it. Now, there was a third film. Uh, again, I didn't know about this until I just started, I, uh, last few months started seeing the Facebook ads popping up. Malevolence 3, Killer. Is this the, this is the base, basically completes your, like, trilogy quote unquote yeah i mean we um we did leave it open-ended it was uh it was a really strange tough shoot because um the lead actor committed suicide before we finished the film oh my god so uh, i had to go back and basically retool the entire movie to kind of leave some of his stuff in but then cut a lot of his stuff out and replace him with a different actor and, and not have it be confusing is that kevin so mckay the- Ke- kelby uh no 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 scott decker kevin mckelvey uh plays perkins okay um, but anyway, so uh, so that happened, and um, it, it it really added a, an an incredible layer of difficulty that I was obviously nobody could be uh, expecting. Um, but then just recently, uh, the star of the film, Jay Cohen, uh, passed away, and we're 
we're still debating on whether or not he died of COVID-19 or not because um, he had flu-like symptoms and then literally dropped dead of a heart attack uh, um, out of nowhere. And he was only 42. So um, they don't really know why he passed away except that he had a heart attack and had flu-like symptoms. So oh, my God. We do think that perhaps uh, that might be what happened, but um, nobody's really sure. But that was back in February. And um, so his, his passing <clears throat> certainly kind of puts an end to any – speculation on whether there'll be a malevolence for they most likely will not because you know he really was the franchise so without him uh it would be really strange uh, going forward and I, it's not something i would really want to be involved in because of that you know, we were best friends and you know we we kind of built this thing together so uh now with him gone it's it's kind of uh you know it's a little surreal but uh you know i i just don't think uh i don't think my heart would be in it anymore so if there ever was a, a part for it, it'd have to be you know somebody else at the helm. Do you do you own this franchise? I mean, are you like the? Uh, is this? Yeah, I mean, it's all me. I mean, it's it's only me. So you know, I, I do everything pretty much. You know, I, I raise the money, I, I write, direct, produce, edit, score, uh, I distribute. Um, you know, I even do the advertising. So it's it's really just a, a one man show. Um, and and Malevolence Three uh, for certain. Uh, was almost completely uh, myself and just a, a bare bones crew of people just kind of helping out on the side because um, you know, the, especially once we lost Scotty, we had to reshoot like seventy percent of the film and oh. we already burned through our budget. So it was really just me and a camera, and um, so it's kind of a miracle that it all got finished. But um, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 really it's all me. You know, you talk about like. Uh, you know, scrappy, bare bones, independent filmmaking. Um, I can definitely say, you know, if you have an idea for making a film, you know, just go out and do it. You can do it because, um, you know, you really don't need a huge crew. You don't need a lot of money. You really just need to have the story and you need to have willing participants, people who are willing to go out there and work with you and hopefully, you know, not for a lot of money, uh, just for the fun of doing it. And I'm blessed to have a lot of people in my life who, uh, just enjoy working with me, uh, no matter what it is, and we'll, you know, go that extra mile to to help me, you know, complete these uh, these projects. Where did you shoot the first uh, Malevolence? So it it came out in two thousand four. So again, my timelines all sorts of messed up when I actually watched this movie. No, no, you're <laughs> actually right. It was two thousand and three that oh. we uh, screened that. But you have to understand when we did that, we didn't have a distribution deal in place. So you're just walking um, around with the movie, basically being like, "You want to see yeah, it?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we had screened it. I think the only thing we had done up to that point is we won the Long Island Film Festival. We won Best Feature, and um, so we had uh, some. You know, we had, we basically were just getting it out there, and we got some reviews from the Bijou Theater, and that made its way to Anchor Bay, and uh, you know, the rest was history. So good old but, yeah, Anchor but Bay. Two thousand three. Yeah, good old Anchor Bay. You know, they're they're still. I mean, I guess in a way um, they're still around, but um, you know, I was unfortunate to. Well, I was fortunate to work with them with Malevolence. They did a great job, but they were transitioning by the time Brutal Massacre and Bereavement came out. So those releases were really, really bare bones, and uh, and it showed in 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 the way it was uh, put out there. So it's another reason why I was very happy to get all the rights back from them and re-release it myself the right way because um you know i i you know obviously they're my films so i i really wanted to do right by them but i do think that you know the franchise deserved it because um you know they were, were unwilling to put out uh, a blu-ray version uh so that's why i had to really take it over and do it myself years ago anchor bay is basically like for anyone not familiar listening anchor bay is very similar to aero vestron and i want to say scream factory scream factory is probably the biggest one shout factory in terms of of like what you could compare Anchor Bay to. Anchor Bay was putting everything out on DVD when DVD was blowing up and with bonus material, lots of bonus material. Vestron and and Arrow do that a lot as well. Arrow is bigger in the UK, but I definitely want to say Scream Factory has d- probably picked up more titles than Anchor Bay has ever touched. I mean, they get the most obscure things and they have the Hollywood blockbusters, whereas Anchor Bay was primarily the the you know the 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 cult film second tier market the evil dead the reanimator uh brutal massacre but scream factory has definitely done that as well with you know sh- smaller independent horror movies but also the blockbusters like 
Poltergeist 2 and uh, uh, 13 Ghosts we have coming out and things like that. Yeah, Anchor Bay definitely mastered the art of the repackaging. You know, I, I think I think they re-released Evil Dead like 15 times in a different box um, <laughs> and made money on it, made money on it every single time. And I know they had the Halloween property for a long time too and made a ton of money off that. Right, Halloween, um, Halloween Four, and Halloween Five because they when uh, Screen Factory wanted to put out uh, the box set, they had to do the big team up, and, and so it's like Screen Factory, Anchor Bay, plus Universal or whoever owned the rights, Macafa, Ackard. Um, to the other films, uh, Dimension. That was that was it. Yes, Dimension. Yeah, they had it for a while too, and then um, I think it was it almost went to Platinum Dunes, and then it finally went to uh, Bloomhouse. Right. Here's a, here's a, actually a, a little uh, interesting tidbit. Um, there's an actress, Andy Matichak, uh, who stars in the Halloween, the new Halloween films. She was actually cast as the lead uh, to play Ellie in Malevolence Three, and I ended up having to fire her day of footage because uh, her agent was a complete psychopath. Wow. Um, as you know, you know, I'm I'm a small independent person and so, you know, we are my films are, you know, you show up and um you don't ask questions and you don't get paid. Um but, you know, you're you're there to be, to make a movie and to enjoy yourself and and it's the thrill of just making a film. And I tell everybody that up front, you know, I say, look, this is not a luxurious uh experience, you know, it's 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 difficult. And um, you know, it's it's something that you're just going to have to enjoy, or or just not participate. And you know, when we explain that, uh, you know, basically her agent was coming back saying that she needs to have uh, her own private car, her own private oh my uh, god service, and 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 her own RV. And we were like, do you realize that the things you're mentioning are like more than our entire budget? And she's like, well, that's that's what she has to have. Otherwise, you know, she's not going to do the picture. And I said, well, then you have the unfortunate uh, job of going back and telling her that she's off the picture because we can't do it. Uh, and so we we fired her. But it's so funny. You know, she certainly landed on her feet by landing the role in Halloween. But it just goes to show you what a small world it is. When I saw that she was cast in that, I was, like, blown away. I was like, wow. I was so happy for her because, obviously, we liked her. You know, we wanted her in the film. But it just didn't work out. In my attempt to get a film made during quarantine uh, 2020, back at the uh, – God, I mean, we, we this thing could have been shot, cut, and put together by now. But the whole thing fell apart. Uh, late March, I had the idea of filming a multi-camera film in quarantine. Everyone films their own scenes, and then we piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Film your own scene. Everyone's going to be their own DP. Everyone will get a DP credit, basically. And I'm going to direct you however I can. Two, then when the whole thing falls apart. The one is like, gets the script, is like, Chris, I need lines. I have to have lines or whatever. It's important that I have lines. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because who knows when that's going to happen. Um, I'm kind of on the front lines with that, too, and uh, we had some projects that kind of uh, fell apart because of this, and I... I honestly don't know where this is all going to head because um, it's going to be really, really tough. Uh, until this thing is solved, and that could be years, it's going to be really tough to get people into a, a dark room uh, huddled together to watch a film. It's just not going to happen. So, And that's going to create a glut that we're planned because these films are made two years in advance. So um, it's, it's really interesting to see how that's all going to play out. And um, I don't know how you're going to be able to convince financiers to... Uh, pony up money for films that don't have a place to go um you know especially the bigger ones so i don't know it's they think really the drive-ins hard. are going to bring it all back yeah i don't think so i don't i think uh i think by the time you get those back up and running this thing will be over but relating to your comment about like the the actress needed all these things or because her agent said the whole thing fell apart or whatever i was just like okay well you're out and then i had to rewrite the script i rewrote the script like four times to make people happy and then the thing is just not being filmed. It, it just it completely fell apart. So I went from being the director and big big producer of, the, of this like multi camera project to a uh, a PSA about COVID nineteen. Oh, the plot was basically a thief that could shape shift. So we we're gonna have like four different actresses play the same character. Right. But I literally well, had to take out so much out of the script because the main actress left that had like a boat and a boathouse and the water was right next to her place so she could go in the water and not have to worry about being around people. She had a wetsuit. All this stuff or whatever I had written in there for her, I had to completely take out and it just started making the script more and more complicated as they were like – the other writer was just like, so what happened to the boat? I'm like, we don't have a boat anymore because the actress left because she has to go work on NCIS. And he's like, but what are we going to do with the boat? I'm like, get rid of the boat, dude. We don't have one. You can't find someone with a boat? I'm like, are you kidding me? I can't find somebody with a boat in quarantine? No. Ah. It can get frustrating. 
that's for sure. It could definitely get frustrating. But, uh, I mean, uh, you know, dovetailing back to what I was saying about Andy, I mean, she, you know, it wasn't really her fault. It was really her her, her, her agent's fault that, that kind of, uh, you know, killed it because, uh, you know, she was actually great about the whole thing. It's just that, uh, you know, certain demands were being met. And I guess, um, you know, we weren't willing to, to cave into it. And it was just kind of, a you know, the immovable object and the unstoppable force. And it just kind of blew up. But that sucks. It happens. I mean, that's so it, it does it seem like the third film of your trilogy has been the hardest because of the the deaths associated with it. It doesn't seem like the first or second one had, excuse me, nearly as many problems. Well, I mean, if I really look back in retrospect, uh, Bereavement was by far the hardest film to shoot. Uh, and I find it very ironic because on that film, I had the most money. I had access to anything I wanted, the best crew the best you know the whatever cast i you know wanted to bring in i was able to bring in uh so i got everything that i wanted on that film and it turned out to be the hardest shoot um and looking back i to me what was most difficult really just kind of trying to keep it all together with such uh, a large uh team and uh that's why on malevolence 3 i went back to my roots basically went back to a really small tight-knit crew and um I find I, I work much better that way because um, it's just it's funny it's the more money you have doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have less problems it actually does create more problems and it also creates stress uh, that isn't there when you're not burning through cash every hour uh. you're not you know getting what you need so um, you know there's a lot of stress involved with that too and and I actually find that I, I do tend to thrive under that stuff it just bother me it's just um it's just you know, looking back malevolence one was a difficult shoot but it was difficult because i didn't have good people around me bereavement i had a lot of great people around me but it just uh it kind of got away from me uh you know uh, in a lot of ways and malevolence three i feel like was in shit happened that was completely out of our control at that point you know um what happened with scott was we were 75 percent done and he basically was like look you know i'm really sick and i have to take some time and so we stopped production and said hey look man take all the time you need and when you're ready we'll come back and we'll finish but he never came back so uh and then we actually found out you know months later what happened so you know we were left with a film that was unfinished and you know i had to get creative and it took me a long time to figure out you know at first i was like you know screw it i'm, I'm just not going to finish this movie it's not meant to be um, you know, and I was kind of feeling sorry for myself and feeling sorry for him. And, you know, just nobody really wanted to be, you know, involved. But then after some time passed, I said, you know, we got to finish this movie. And, you know, I came up with a solution to how to do it, but, you know, currently, um, and, and we were able to get it done. And it's funny, you know, sometimes you'll, you read reviews and people will say things. Uh, but it's like, you know, I, I don't mind any bad reviews because I know that really nobody understands what we went through to finish this film. You know, and obviously, it's every anybody's opinion. You know, they can think whatever they want. I mean, movies are meant to be entertaining. If you're not entertained, fine. But for me, there's really nothing anybody can say to kind of sour my mood about the film. I'm really proud of what we did and how it came out. Um, and it's not just that it's because of all those problems that we had, um, but that becomes a big part of it. You know, you, there's a certain level of uh, pride in knowing that, you know, something that probably shouldn't have gotten finished, we were able to finish. Um, so, you know, so I, I, I feel good about it. And for me, uh, looking back, it's my favorite of the three films for a lot of reasons, but that's the main reason. I've only seen the first two, uh, Malevolence and Bereavement. Again, I didn't even realize there was a third film until I saw the, the Facebook ad. Um, since you said you're not going to be making any more after this due to the unfortunate, you know, passing of some of the uh, – people involved with the movie uh, is it like retired is 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 that it and you pretty much kind of move on to other projects i mean yeah i've been moved on to other projects for a while so i do have a lot of other stuff that i'm working on and um i'm not saying that it's definitely never going to happen but um but as of right now it's 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 not on the horizon you know i'm kind of happy with how we wrap things up we did leave it open but uh but for now i, I don't i don't see uh, a fourth one, but but again, you never never know what what could happen. Your uh, mockumentary, so, uh, I, I never seen it in an hour. Your mockumentary movie, which I compare to, this is Spinal Tap, uh, Brutal Massacre. I would love to see a follow up to that. You know, it's it's funny we were working on a follow up to that too. Uh, that was based around Gunnar Hansen's character, and of course, he passed away in 2015. So, 
<laughs> we're not able to make that either. But that was, uh, we had a script written, uh, and uh, everybody was on board. And basically, the the the, well, you you know the film. So the the the, the storyline was um, we were going to follow uh, Brian O'Halloran's character Jade onto the Amazon, uh, where he's scouting locations for his film, and um, and he goes missing, and so. Uh, Harry Penderecki uh, finds out about it and um, decides to, to help out and go searching for him. And he and he kind of puts his team together, but this time for a, a rescue mission. And uh, he ends up bringing uh, Gunner's character Crenshaw on board because, of course, he knows the jungle because he was in Vietnam. And uh, it w- it would have been a really freaking hysterical movie. We had some really really funny set pieces, uh, in, you know, and ideas for it. But um, and everybody was on board. But of course. You know, with Gunner's passing, there's really nobody that could take his place. So it kind of that that uh, that project. That's that's too bad. I, that's what I kind of figured that there wouldn't be a sequel um, with with Gunner. But then that makes the movie special all on its own. I mean, they never made a sequel to This Is Spinal Tap, and you don't necessarily need a sequel to your movie. Yeah, no, I think it was uh, you know certainly a, a one-off thing. That um, I mean, the, the entire film was inspired uh, based on uh, a, a journal that I kept malevolence so everything that happens to harry in that movie actually happened to me in real life oh my god me kind of yeah it was just me turning all those things on its head and laughing at it but all the things that go down in that film uh even even to the point where you know the losing the negative almost at the end and you know uh giving money to the guy who steals it and crashes the van and uh the body that the guy builds that looks you know supposed to be great turned out to be terrible and um you know, I mean, every single thing that pretty much in that film uh, was inspired by uh, something that actually happened on our set. That's not. I, I can't believe. I, I that's that's so unbelievable that you turned your real life story into a uh, into a true a uh, true comedy with uh, events. Is it said any time in the movie? It's now. It's been a little while since I've seen Brutal Massacre or if I've shown it to anybody. But is there any point in the? Is there any point in the credits at the beginning and end that say based loosely on true events that happened to the director? <laughs> No, but actually, on the new release, on the new Blu-ray, um, there's a commentary of mine where I talk uh, uh, throughout the film and and tell you uh, what you know what actually happened uh, during the scene that you're watching, how it was you know what, what originally inspired it. That's so too funny. So if you listen to the commentary, it'll give you a lot of those details. That's too. Oh, that's too great. I definitely gotta look for that Blu-ray because I have the uh, I have the DVD. I have it signed by Brian. Um, O'Halloran, um, because he was promoting it at uh, Rock and Shock, a horror convention that has now ended, not because of COVID nineteen, but the uh, uh, the partnership of Rock and Shock split up this past January, so it is no longer um, happening. But uh-huh. uh, he had come to Rock and Shock and was promoting uh, Brutal Massacre. Yeah, yeah, Brian's great like that. He promotes that film every every con that he goes to, um, and uh, we've we've attended a few uh, together, and it's always a lot of fun uh, with him. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, the new the new disc uh, it, it really uh, blows away the the Anchor Bay release. Um, you can l- literally just throw that one in the trash, as far as I'm concerned, because once you see the new uh, transfer, um, it's I don't even know how I, I can't even watch the old one now. Well, I can't throw it away because Brian Brian signed it. But <laughs> I'll get I'll get him to sign the new one for you. How's that? Uh, well, what's okay? What's funny though is that the uh, I. He didn't have any more copies at his table, or he didn't have any at Rock and Shock. And the Sunday, the final day, he said to me, "You know what? I know for fact that this is in stores right now. So if you find a copy, bring it to me, and I'll sign it to you for free." And I was like, "You serious?" He's like, "Absolutely." And sure enough, Walmart had a copy of it at, uh, nice. in Oxford, Massachusetts. Uh, Oxford, Massachusetts, uh, right where I found uh, bereavement at someone's yard sale. And I was just like, ah, that's it. That's that's the movie. And I and because uh, I went online and looked it up on on uh, Walmart's website, and uh, yeah, they they said they had they had copies in stock or whatever. And, and uh, this is where you this is when you could go to any store, and they would have a huge, massive DVD section. And Walmart still does, but you know what I mean. It's like everything was would be carried at a store nowadays. It's like. Disney and you know Universal or whatever the mainstream stuff is, you're lucky if you find an independent movie at a, yeah, uh, now, a, now it's a retail all top store, 40. right? Unless you go to something like Bull Moose, which is a big chain up in the up, up in the uh, parts of uh, Maine and, and New Hampshire, um, 
they thrive on DVDs and stuff like that. But FYE, they've gone completely out of business almost. In, and uh, Newberry Comics, which I'm sure you're familiar with, doesn't have a DVD section as much as they used to anymore. God only knows if they'll survive COVID-19. But uh, it, it, it's funny when you think about it. Like almost 20 years ago, you could go to any store and find every independent movie that would come out. And nowadays it's like you need you need ads like on Facebook to be like, oh, hey, I know Malevolence. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's really the only way to reach people now is uh, either through Google or, or through Amazon or through Facebook because um, there really is no brick-and-mortar presence for uh, DVDs. I mean, even Best Buy has completely shaved it down to like the top 40 films, and uh, I know Walmart's the same thing. Getting into Walmart is, is almost impossible, even for like the bigger films. A lot of bigger films can't, can't get placement. So, um, yeah, you really have to reach people through the internet now and it's kind of cool that people are still uh collecting stuff on blu-ray because i mean a lot of people don't know this and why would they but when you watch stuff on like say netflix or itunes um it's drastically compressed so um there is a, a benefit to buying blu-rays because the quality is so much better um and if you put them side by side you know you don't see all the banding and the the, the color loss like you do when you watch something on Netflix so it really is great especially if it's a film that you like not only are you going to get all those extras uh, that you don't get you know when you watch it on streaming but you are seeing a, a far superior picture especially when you watch stuff you know with like low light scenes and dark scenes you don't get all that you know uh, distortion and banding that you do on the stream and it's also um, another uh, another company that is still putting out discs on film uh, that I should all that should always be mentioned because um, without them there wouldn't be the preservation of films like there are there is uh, Criterion Collection and they you know their biggest their their no pun intended their biggest release was the uh, the Godzilla Collection from the six you know the fifties and sixties and seventies and uh, they're they're going to be doing the next set of Godzilla films from the eighties and nineties but they also have like you know War of the Worlds coming out soon but man the catalog of films that they have for what they consider to be the you know the best versions of films like ever you know what I mean whatever they're 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 what a lot of these companies strive to be you know what I mean the preservation yeah. of films uh, Scream Factory Arrow Bestron it's it, they're very akin to like uh, have you ever heard of Vertigo comic books before it got scuttled I think I have yeah so Vertigo Comics for anyone not familiar with them was the division of DC Comics that put out mature edgy comics they didn't want to care about the Comic Code Authority they put out comic books cussing swearing boob you know the nudity and violence and hellraiser john constantine obviously thrived in that death uh animal man uh stuff like that but at the time they were doing it nobody was really doing that and nowadays there's like comic book companies all over the place that have those type of books so dc kind of stopped that publication and that's what i see like criterion i don't see criterion ever like shutting down but they are the preservation of films uh, that a lot of companies strive to be because of the fact that they they do care about you know some really oddball films like Kevin Smith's Chasing Amy's on there. It's the only Kevin Smith movie that's on there. But that movie's tented as like one of the uh, biggest best representations of the LGBT community sometimes. Yeah, and it's important that they preserve those films. It's really important uh, because uh, when something goes off a streaming service. You know, how do you watch that film? You can't go and rent it anymore. So, you know, unless you, sh- you have a physical copy, it's really the only way to guarantee that you'll have access to that movie. And you should not go to torrent to find it. Yeah, it's a shame too because the torrenting is really what has destroyed everything. Um, you know, and it's it's what has almost completely eliminated uh, you know filmmakers uh, like myself from from the fold because you can't um it, it's it's very very hard to to monetize stuff now right even when malevolence 3 came out it was literally on about 50 pages of, of google uh where you could just watch it you know streaming for free just click a button and watch it so you know i would say it's it's up there with about maybe 50 percent of all views now or more are, are just you know people watching it for free on on pirated streaming sites right and, and it's sad too because these pirates are actually making money uh you can subscribe to their channel and and you're paying them and the filmmakers are getting nothing um and you know i get it you know when people say oh well you know uh disney has enough money it's one thing you know you know i don't advocate piracy in any uh for any films for, for, from any company but when you pirate uh small independent films like mine you're literally 
preventing me from going out and making another film. Um, and this is the reason why it takes me so long in between films is because I have to raise the money, which takes a tremendous amount of time. And if we were able to, you know, show the the uh, uh, financial financials that would, you know, back up these uh, budgets, it would be a lot easier. But you can't because um, just to give you a, a small example, um, back when Blockbuster was around, when someone would rent a film for five bucks, half of that went directly to the filmmaker. So if you rented my movie Malevolence for five dollars at Blockbuster, I got two dollars and fifty cents per rental. Now, if someone watches my film on Amazon Prime, I get four cents. So think about how many times someone has to watch it on Amazon Prime before I make just that two fifty. It's like now I'd have to. Back then, if I rented, you know, if if um, you know, ten thousand people rented my film, I could possibly break even. Now I'd have to have a million people to watch it, and it's like you know, when you lose that kind of revenue stream, it's it's really hard to make it back anywhere else. Um, especially when you're not doing theatrical. So it's, it's, it's definitely tough. It makes it really, really hard. Um, and I don't think kids today really understand the damage that they've done by, by watching everything through piracy. Um, you know, it's great that everything's free, but there is a price. The price is that all those cool independent films that you like aren't going to get made. And this is why Disney is never going to release the Black Widow, New Mutants, Warner Brothers is not going to release Wonder Woman on streaming for $20 because they know it's going to go straight to piracy. However, those numbers could be completely that that statement could be completely wrong because Trolls made a hundred million dollars in streaming fees. A hundred million dollars. And yes, I'm sure that it got pirated as well. But the fact it made a hundred million dollars in streaming fees for 20 bucks a pop, that's amazing. No, it really is. It really is. Um, you know, it's it's a whole new paradigm. And um, it, it's, it's going to be cool to see how that all plays out. Because I have a feeling that these companies are not going to have any choice but to... Uh, release these films that way, and and, and they are. Uh, I, I just totally forgot. Uh, Scoob is coming out, I think, next week. Yeah, yeah, and you're going to see more. You're going to see a lot more because um, it's going to back up to the point where you're going to have to start pushing things through, um, because there's a lot of other films uh, behind those that have to push their way through as well. Um, and uh, you know, at some point, you're just going to have to bite the bullet. They're going to have to say, look, you know, we, we've got to get these films out there. Um, you can't hold on to them forever. I mean, I guess you could. I guess you could just, you know ignore all the marketing that you've done to this point and just you know shelve them but um you know it, it's kind of like an assembly line like you got to keep it moving so um yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see how it plays out but in in my opinion i just don't see theaters uh recuperating this year um so that's that's when you think about it that's another you know seven to eight months that's a long time to have nothing coming out at all right 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 and uh it's it's bad out there for certain cinemas um, especially small independent cinemas that are not the big ones because the big ones are I, I don't even, <laughs> at the time this is going to air I don't even want to get into it right now while recording it the whole thing with AMC versus Universal it's like Jesus Christ guys you guys are in financial crap ruin before COVID-19 and now you're pulling this you're, you're doing this or whatever with this like we're not going to show Universal movies so we don't care about money it, you're it's <laughs> It, it, it's such a mess. Yeah, well, I you mean, gotta understand their their perspective is they're 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 fucked either way because yeah. they're screwed because of COVID nineteen appears because then nobody's coming to the theater either way nobody's coming to the theater so they're screwed no matter what. And, I, I and think when you look at it in that perspective, it's like you know what is the upside? Like how how do they fix this? I, I really don't know. I mean, yeah, sure, drive-ins, okay, but I I really don't know how how they recuperate from this without some kind of magic bullet oh. where they literally go on tv and say hey everybody it's solved you know you can all go about your business without that you're not getting people back in the theater well it was great it was great talking to you and um you know uh let's definitely stay in touch and um i'll let you know when uh brutal massacre drops and thanks for sharing that poster with me that was really cool to see that again yes absolutely steve and and if you want to find out more information about Steven's projects, films, and everything else, go to stevenmena.com, and you can check out some of the amazing work that he's done. I highly recommend uh, the movie uh, Malevolence. It's definitely a tour de force in the horror independent cinema to see. It's always uh, a independent horror movie that I recommend to people when they say, show me something I've never seen before. And I'm like, have you seen Malevolence? And once in a while, I will show somebody Malevolence who's never seen it.
Nice. And it's Stephen with an A, just in case, because a lot of people put S-T-E-V-E-N, and they'll go to a totally different website. So it's S-T-E-V-A-N-M-E-N-A.com. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on.